Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. We're sitting here on November the 10th, 1980, in the School of Dentistry at the University of Michigan, and looking back at 41 years of history of a giant in dental education, Professor Albert Richards came you think back to the days when you came to the University of Michigan and uh, what it was like then? Oh, sure. I think we'll have to start back a little bit earlier than that, though. Because I never quite knew where the University of Michigan was when I grew up. I grew up in Chicago and uh, went through the school system there in high school, I took all the shop courses that they, they offered. Ford shop, foundry shop, machine shop, wood shop, print shop, things that they don't offer anymore. Then we had no counseling how we got from a high school to a college. I had an older brother who went to engineering school at Northwestern. So when my turn came, I naturally went to Northwestern in engineering. And uh, from there then, I went to the University of Michigan because I had met a fellow at Northwestern who had an older brother who went to Northwest or went to University of Michigan. So I said, I'll go with you. I truly thought that you got on a boat at Ann Arbor and it steamed across Lake Michigan and deposited one at Ann Arbor. And when I got to see a map, I was amazed at how far inland Ann Arbor was from the shores of Lake Michigan. So my friend and I drove to Ann Arbor, and I needed a job, and so I um, found a, a place where I could earn my eats at the Michigan Wolverine. That was an eating house on State Street opposite Lane Hall. We would feed 600 persons at night. I was on the steam table. Now for my room, I roomed at 1034 East Huron Street, which would now be Center Stage Power Theater. The landlady was a person who had no hearing. She had lost it due to a childhood illness. And uh, since she couldn't hear, she didn't speak. So I was the janitor at this house all during my undergraduate career, and I learned to speak with my fingers, the normal alphabet, so I could communicate with this person. I was her ears to the outside world. And uh, I went through the chemical engineering program here at the University of Michigan, and upon graduation, I thought I would like to pursue the PhD degree. And so, I needed a bread and butter job. One of the engineering professors, Professor Siebert, told me of an opening at the dental school. Now, the dental school is a big building at the end of East University that I'd been in perhaps once during my entire career here. And a very affordable place, and I went and applied. Dr. Benting, Russell Benting was the dean, and he interviewed three of us young uh, graduate engineers. And Dr. Benton was somewhat of a photographer. In his, uh, in his interview, he learned that I had done color printing way back in the 1930s. And this was the example that I brought and showed to him. It's a, better right side up. It's a silver bowl of fruit, and it was made by the wash-off relief process. But way back in the 1930s, this was extremely time-consuming, very costly. But here you see, 45 years later, the colors are as bright as ever. But he admired this, and uh, I think for no other reason than when I had done this, he chose me over the other two persons. And uh, I was always grateful for that. 
So photography played quite a role in my life. What was he looking for in an individual? Uh, what was the job position that they were trying to fill at that time with an engineer? Well, they had always had a woman in charge of the x-ray department, and he was not happy. He was a chauvinist from way back. And uh, he, he wanted a male in there. I remember his comment with glee, he'd be nailed to the wall for saying it in this day and age, but he said, that we've always had women in here, and they're just not dependable. They have babies and things like that. And so that was his reason for having a, a choosing a male. Um, times were different in those days. What year are we talking about? This was 1940. I forgot to mention, along the way, I had a, a job that uh, helped me earn my tuition. Uh, that was before I came to Ann Arbor. I was a lifeguard on the shores of Lake Michigan. And uh, here I am, at age 20, uh, all, all bonds, as lifeguards always are. And uh, the reason I brought that up is that we just uh, have a president-elect meeting who, in the past week, has been displaying pictures of his lifeguard days and uh, saying that he had pulled out 77 people in his 11 years of lifeguarding. But I only lifeguarded one year, and I only pulled out 12. But my average is better per year than his. <laughs> Indeed, I guess. When you went to college at Northwestern, uh, was that for a short period of time before you came to Ann Arbor? Yes. Um, well, there was an intermediate stop between high school and Northwestern. I went to junior college, and in junior college, um, I spent two years and met the, the uh, young lady that I eventually married. Now, uh, while I was in junior, co junior college in Chicago, I was the captain of the wrestling team. And I think I was given a $100 scholarship to go to Northwestern University. I was never there long enough to uh, participate. It was the first year we were not allowed to engage in sports, evidently. So that was the beginning and the end of my wrestling career. But anyway, I took engineering courses and machine shop and things like that while I was at Northwestern. Then you came to Ann Arbor, finished your bachelor's degree, mm -hmm. and were beginning your graduate studies right. at that point in time. And to support that activity, you applied to the School of Dentistry for a job in the x-ray department. Mm -hmm. And from that point, you must have gone to school part-time. Oh, yes. And in the end, you are the job is going to pay $1,400 a year. When I was chosen for the job, he said it was $1,200 a year. For some reason, I guess I stiffened my back, and we got it back to the starting point of $1,400 a year. This is for 12 months' work, $1,400. Now, the hours were rather nice in those days. The clinic, as I recall, started at 10 in the morning, which allowed me to get in 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock classes, and would terminate at 4. And then during the summertime, we would just open a couple hours in the afternoon. There was very little clinical work to do. So I was able to pack in a lot of graduate courses uh, during the summer sessions. And in 1943, I had earned a master's in physics. And I went on a couple years beyond that toward the PhD in physics. And I was way up in the higher math, and it had gotten extremely difficult. And uh, the family had started to come around by then. My duties at the dental school were expanded, became more demanding. And I was literally being torn three ways, and I couldn't hack it. So something had to give. And since the eating habit was th thoroughly entrenched and financed by the dents, I threw my lot with them. And uh, so I didn't uh, intend to make a career of dentistry. It just happened that way. I kind of backed into it. When you started in the uh, radiographic area, was the was the area, this area of dentistry well developed at that time? 
No pun intended, of course. <laughs> no, it wasn't well developed. But uh, we fixed that over the years. I'd like to show the, uh, the building when I came. Now, this is an earlier version, but this was the building, and the X-ray department occupied this series of windows right up here. The dean's office was down here. The library was here. The Crown and Bridge Department underneath the large lecture hall was here. And uh, Charlie Hall, who was the one who doled out all of the supplies and treasure and all those things, he was in here. And then we had uh, Dr. Ostrander. We had Mary Crowley in the bacteriology lab. This was a large amphitheater up in here. This faces east. That would be toward the IOTC building, which is our neighboring building, and the clinic area was all back here and extending all the way across the back. And uh, it was very high. Underneath were the uh, basic science laboratories and the, uh, and the uh, dental materials laboratory. The library was in this section here. Then in 1930, well, let's see, let's look inside of the, the building. This was the clinic when I started, and you see it was very, very high, and there was no privacy. You could see who's in the adjacent chair and so on. This was the cage which housed the cashier and the person who dispensed supplies. Uh, a skylight and, and rafters up there. Once in a while, a bird would find his way in the clinic. And to have patients seated here, lying back with their mouths open and birds flying overhead, presented a bit of a hazard. <laughs> and so we, uh, we had a uh, one man who used to get in there with a booty gun and uh, shoot down the birds. There was no other way to, to get at them. So that's what the old clinic looked like. Then in 1939, they put up the Kellogg building, and that attached onto the west end of the dental school. I watched them put this up in the health service building right next to it. And uh, this is where the postgraduate and graduate courses were held at that time. That was considered a very, very elegant building in those days. As you continued your education in physics, how did you get training in dental x-rays? To be perfectly truthful, when I first started this work, I could tell an upper tooth from a lower tooth only if I looked in the mouth. If they were stuck in the upper jaw, it was an upper tooth every time. If they were inserted in the lower jaw, they were lower teeth. But if you give me a handful of teeth, and asked me to sort them out. In those early days, I could not have done so. I, I learned, um, it was really self-taught. There was no place one could go for training in those days, and it hasn't improved a great deal over the years. People who are trained in this area are extremely um, scarce. I recall the first examination I ever gave, I learned a great deal. On, on uh, this examination, I drew a picture of a three-rooted teeth, a uh, tooth, and the roots were extending downward, and I drew them very long. So the question was a two-part question. What is, what fault is illustrated here? And the obvious answer to my mind was elongation. And the second part was, what is the remedy? And I expected them to say, you change the vertical angulation in the proper manner. Well, every person in the class said, the fault is you have a picture of an upper tooth, picture upside down, the remedy is simply turn it up right side up. Well, I had to, had to go to my right, and I'm afraid I flunked that exam. <laughs> Do you think that, um, as you made the comment, that we, we don't have training facilities for 
um, people that are teachers of radiography. Uh, that seems a bit strange in, in today's uh, dependence upon uh, radiographs for diagnosis that we don't have that. I think part of the problem is that there has never been a specialty of dental radiology. We have specialists in oral surgery, we have specialists in endodontics, and so on. But there is no specialty as such, no society that uh, we gave them sp specialty status. And uh, until that happens, I don't think that uh, you will have a lot of people going into this kind of a career because it was not a high-paying career as, as was these specialists. Now, there have been attempts over the years, I'm thinking at the University of Alabama, where they did get a federal grant and for a number of years, they did train persons. Uh, it led to a master's degree in dental radiology, and all of those people are employed. But no program exists now. Not that I'm familiar with. Now, there'll be various attempts at uh, Rare Alabama, and I think Pennsylvania for a while, but I don't know of any active programs at the moment. Let's return to 1943. Who are some of the individuals that you worked with and uh, had some, perhaps, some interesting experiences with in your early career? Well, there was uh, Dr. Marcus Ward. He was the dean before Bunting. He was a noted educator, and uh, he was a so a sprightly, very slender gentleman. And he seemed to exude energy. He'd dance around, he'd glare over the school, looking over everybody's shoulder. And uh, that wasn't too popular with some of the faculty members, I'm told. This occurred before my day. But he was uh, still very much present when I joined the team. Now, Benton was the dean. John Kemper. A DDS MD man was the head of oral surgery. Now I'm just thinking, going around the, the floors, we had uh, Dick Kennedy. He was a very uh, a short man, short in stature. Uh, he was in charge of full denture. O.C. Applegate was in charge of partial denture. Ralph Singer was in charge of endodontics. That sort of completes what was up. Oh, no, there was uh, one other, uh, Frank Vetter. Uh, he was in charge of Criminal Bridge. Uh, Dr. Harold Held was in charge of the examination room. Lewis Schultz was in charge of the clinic. Now, that, I think, takes care of the first floor. Now, under, on the first, no, the second floor. On the first floor, we had Hilda Lankin in the library, and then Dean Benton was next. And uh, Zana Mears came around pretty early in the game. She's registrar. And uh, there was Dorothy Howard, who was the director of hygiene, and later became Mrs. Russell Bunting. Then we had Philip J., who was very prominent in the early work in Carey's research. And then we had uh, Paul Jezrick, who was uh, kind of leading the postgraduate work in Kellogg Building. Then we had Kenneth Eslick in uh, children's dentistry, George Moore in orthodontics. Then down the basement we had Floyd Payton, who was in charge of dental materials. And we um, had something in common with him yes. when he came into the dental school. What was that? Well, Floyd Payton and I were non dentists. And uh, it was made very plain to us that uh, we were sort of a subclass of individuals. The dentist was the all powerful, and then came the second class. And, uh, it hurt to be discriminated against and be told this by the officials. Uh, 
uh, that I'm happy to say has not persisted over the years, and uh, now I believe the proper people understand that persons with other of other disciplines have something to offer that the dental training doesn't offer, and so that we can be treated as equals. And I think you uh, indeed were pioneers in the in retrospect as as we uh, look at dental education today and go back to the 1940s, early 1940s, you indeed were the first two non-dentists to break the barrier, as I can tell in the history of the school. Well, Floyd was a PhD in metallurgy, Floyd Payton, and I was a master's in physics. Um, to the best of my knowledge, I'm the only uh, master's candidate, I believe, the holder of the master's degree in the for a professor. It's quite an accomplishment in that environment. Of those early uh, characters that were here, did you have any uh, recall of any one individual that may have influenced your career in one way or another over, over someone else? Well, Dr. Eislick um, was a very great man. It's, it's sad to think that the present dental students have no idea who this man was. Uh, he was the head of our children's dentistry. He initiated this specialty. He later initiated a second dental specialty, public health dentistry. He's the only man in history who ever initiated two specialties. He worked his students very hard, and as students, they frequently disliked him because of this. And it was only in later years when they realized what he had done for them that they really began to appreciate the, the stature of this man. He worked himself twice as hard as he worked them. Um, a number of years ago, I became aware that there was a an award given by the university called the Distinguished Faculty Achievement Award. I learned about these things being offered to so and so in the engineering school, the lit literature, science, and arts, the medical school, but never the dental school. And so I wondered, why is this? We certainly have deserving persons in our staff. Well, I soon learned that these plumes do not drop out of the sky they must be cultivated. And so I formed a committee. And first, this committee has to write an affidavit as to the remarkable attributes of this person. And for example, you would write that he walks on water on Tuesdays, he does morning miracles Thursday afternoons, and you, you tell all these wonderful attributes this person has. Well, then you have to get evidence documenting these statements. And so this committee wrote to his former students. They were all over the world, many in high positions in other countries. And they explained what we were doing. We had to collect substantiated data as to the attributes of this giant among men. And so they wrote these letters from all over the world and sent them to us. We made copies of these letters and bound them into packets, which were given to the committee that was to judge whether this man was worthy or not. The originals we bound between hard covers, a leather-bound book. Well, we did such a complete job that we snowed the committee. He was a shoe-in. And so the presentation occurred at the graduate school, the Rackham Building, in the evening, and the speaker read the affidavit, he walks on water, he does minor miracles, and so on, and so on. And so then he, he had been not known anything about this until about two or three days before the presentation, when the university president told him that he should appear. Then he sort of caught on. But uh, then he stood up, and he was roundly applauded and given a check for a thousand dollars 
And then we all went over to the league ballroom and there was a reception line and everybody got a chance to shake his hands and the other four recipients. There was always five of these granted every year. And Dr. Easley told me it was very, very nice hearing all these folks applauding. It was very nice to get the thousand dollar check, but that was soon spent. It was nice to be greeted by all of his friends at the league, but he said the very nicest part about this whole thing was that he could sit at home and pick out this book from his library shelf and thumb through the letters that were written from his former students. He said that was the best part of all. Now we did this once again, the same committee, and we did it this time for Dr. Payton. And again, we were successful. Last and warm feeling. Yeah. Both were very great men. In the 1960s, I was one of your students. And my class called you Mr. Wizard. <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we called you Mr. Wizard because of your teaching techniques. They were innovative, creative, uh, without comparison. I wonder what, how you perceive your method of teaching. What is your philosophy of teaching? How did you come about uh, through time to arrive at the techniques that you use? Well, first, I, I view the students as being members of the same team. We are not antagonists. Uh, we are to work together. Now, I am working in an area that is quite unique. In all the other uh, areas, you're working with instruments, tools, physical things that you can see. Here, I am working with a form of radiation. I've never seen x-rays, yet I've worked my whole life with x-rays. To me, they're very, very real, and uh, I can, you know, I can see then casting shadows and diverging, diminishing intensity, and all these things. And so my task really was to make these invisible things as real to the student as I possibly could. And so as a result of working with invisible objects, I had to devise these innovative sorts of teaching aids. And um, I think that some of these have created a a more lasting impression as to what was accomplished than what I look like or sound like or anything else. Indeed they have. There's well, no doubt about that. I'm wondering, as I think back to the time uh, in the 1960s when I was a student, and compare this visual display uh, that you offered the student and continue to offer students today, uh, wonder why that wouldn't be useful in other areas. Have you ever given that some thought, comparing your teaching techniques with other areas? No, yeah, I've never really uh, thought to extend it into to, um, other, other areas. During this time, we've been talking, uh, you mentioned that you started a family. I'd like to talk about your family a little bit. You married your sweetheart from Chicago. Yes. I, I married her on Friday, February 13th. February 13th. Now, her mother was a very superstitious person. And uh, she said, oh, why, why choose a day like that? Why don't you choose the, uh, the 12th, which was, uh, I think, Lincoln's birthday, uh, the 14th, Valentine's Day, by the 13th. Uh, we had decided on the 13th, and we stuck to our guns. Well, this marriage has existed very happily right up to the present time, and hopefully for many years to come. This woman's other child, a son, uh, married also on February 13th, the following year. And that marriage is still existing also. It wasn't a Friday that day. So when folks say Friday the 13th is unlucky, I don't believe it a bit. That was the best day of my life. Indeed. 
How many children do you have now? Well, we knew about 42, and uh, our first daughter arrived in 1944. Now, I recall that in these early days, I used to sing in operettas at Lydia Mendelssohn Theater. And I recall my wife was very pregnant at the time with our first daughter, and uh, she came and watched every one of my performances. Uh, I think it was the Chocolate Soul year that year that we were doing. Well, we have five daughters, and uh, here, here is uh, what, what they look like. Now, it's sort of like living in a, in a sorority house. Now, some fellows have to go to a, a nightclub to see girls run around their underwear. I never had to do that. <laughs> it was very commonplace in my household. <laughs> so, they look like they're uh, fairly close in age from the photograph. Well, right now they range in age from 21 to 35. And they've all left, left the nest. The nest is empty. While they were there, I understand uh, you had some recognition for your skills as a father. Yes, the 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 news one year, 1963, on Father's Day, published this picture, and it shows all the daughters gifting father with suitable gifts. That, that was very, very nice. In addition to your interests in raising family, you have uh, a variety of interests that go beyond the school of dentistry. What are some of those? Well, I like to grow things, and during my retirement year, I hope to continue my gardening efforts. And here is a picture from the United News where they're showing me with some of the grafts that I had done on various fruit trees. So I'm a grafter, not of the political kind, but the botanical kind. And I was able to graft into an apple tree an additional four different types of apples. I still have a sour cherry tree that has one branch that produces sweet cherries. Uh, I recall grafting apple onto pear, pear onto apple, now these grafts did not last over the winter. They, they grew for the year they were grafted in, but they never survived to bear fruit on these strange host trees. I, uh, I met a, a botanical professor, Dr. Clover. She, she uh, was a very clever botanist and was able to graft um, tomatoes and potatoes. I tried, and I was not as clever as she. She would have a flower pot with a potato plant growing, and a tomato plant in another pot. And then she would carve away about half the stem on each one, and then bring the remaining parts together and bind them up. So they still had the roots in their individual pots, and they still had the two tops, but it had the common uh, stem. And as soon as that healed, then she would cut off the tomato roots and the potato top. And so then she had a plant that produced potatoes underground and tomatoes up above. Now I tried a couple times, but I wasn't successful at that one. Well, I always had a dream of building my own house. Well, if you're going to build a house, you need a, you need, you need a, uh, a lot. Well, I've never bought any property before, and uh, I thought, how does one go about this? So, in a logical way, I conceived there must be a master map of Ann Arbor someplace, and all the lots are indicated there. The ones that are sold would be one color, and the ones that are available would be another color. That, to me, seemed the logical way of doing this. Then I wondered, where would this huge map be? Well, there must be some central real estate uh, office. 
Well, I didn't know where this was, and so I went to a real estate office and said I was interested in buying a lot. And uh, the, the woman, she was very kind, because I was very naive, and she could have made me feel very stupid. But uh, she said the realtors are divided. Some deal with uh, industrial property, residential, farm. Which kind are you interested in? Well, residential. Well, then there are some who deal in property on the north side, the south side, east or west. Which side do you like? And uh, I quoted a, a street that I thought was very elegant. And uh, actually, it's a place where the millionaires live. And uh, she was very indulgent in my whims and said, no, I don't think you'd be happy there. Have you ever heard of Rock Creek Drive? Well, no, I've never heard of Rock Creek Drive. So she, she, she explained to me, you go out Gettys Avenue and you turn on Huntington and then up Rock Creek. And there is a house, a gray house, and then immediately beyond this is this lot that we're talking about. And I thanked her. And so at noontime, my wife and I drove out and found this gray house. And uh, there was a stake driven at the edge of this house, and then another one further along, and then the third one still further. Well, uh, between the first and second stake, the, the land was quite low. Between the second and third, it had a very nice rise on it. And so we naturally followed her directions. The house, or the lot, was right after this gray house. And uh, we weren't too impressed buying this low lot. So that evening, the uh, woman's uh, employer called and uh, said, I'm sorry I w wasn't in when you called, but uh, I'd like to take you out and show you this lot on Rock Creek. Well, I didn't bother. We were out. We saw it this noon. And uh, I guess the only way I could shut him up was to be to go out with him. So he drove us out there, and he showed us from the first to the second stake. But then it turned out the lot continued all the way over to the third stake. So here it was really like two lots together. And uh, we could hardly wait to sign the papers because uh, this, this higher part we thought was fine, but then in addition we were going to get this lower bit too. So we bought that. And um, that's how we happened to, to find a spot. Well, I, I like to garden, and so I gardened out, out there a couple of years. I had a friend who was a milkman. Carl Anderson was his name. He worked for Warner Dairy. And um, Carl wanted to visit his brother who lived out in Washington State, I believe it was. And uh, his two-week vacation wasn't long enough to drive out, visit, and drive back. And so he asked his boss, Jim Warner, whether he could have additional time off. And Warner said, sure, if he can find a substitute. Well, this, this occurred during the summertime, and I said to Carl, well, this is during my vacation, so I'll play uh, milkman. And so I was uh, milkman for 19 days during my summer vacation from the university. So I'd get up at 3 in the morning and deliver milk until the morning or 1 or something like that. And Carl had a chance to go out and, and uh, visit his family. And it worked out very nicely. And then later, when I wanted to build a house, I went to the banks and said, here are my plans for the house. I have to buy X number of dollars. Fine. Who's your builder? Well, I am. Well, what experience have you had? Well, during the summer vacation, I worked as a man carpenter for an outfit over in Saline. And my experience there had been putting shingles on third-story roofs in the middle of hot August, or tiling a basement, or doing just rough construction work. They never let me do any of the fine work. But that didn't bother me because I had already taken all the woodshop classes that were offered here at Ann Arbor High in the evenings, and I had done wood carving and cabinet work, so their idea of finished carpenter work was still pretty, pretty crude by my standards. So uh, they said, well, we can't, can't loan you any money. You're not, a, you're not a builder, you're a teacher. Well, that sort of shot my plans down. 
But then Kyle heard of my dreams, and he said, how much do you need? And I told him. He said, well, that's about every penny I have in the world, but I'll give it to you. There's, few, there's very few people um, who you can call friends to that degree, believe me. And so uh, as the bills would come in for the lender and so on, he would, he would lend me the money to pay for them. Uh, he had a mortgage on the property, and so as it developed, uh, his equity grew and covered his expenses. And uh, it, it took me three years to build the house. Now, before we built the house, we were living on Linden Street in a rented house. And my wife and I had decided upon the, um, the plan of the house. And so I was ordering wood delivered to this rented house on Linden Street. And uh, the husband of uh, one of my helpers, Mrs. Ware, told me later, you know, I thought you were nuts. Because here we were delivering all these uh, brown wood, two by fours, two by tens, two by twelves, and so on, shoving them in the basement of this rented house. We thought you were trying to heat your house with brown wood lumber or something. Well, what I was doing, I was cutting the lumber. Like when you put in a window, there's a header that goes over the top. It's composed of a couple of two by eights or two by tens. And then there's a corner, there's junction posts and different kinds of things, and then you need a certain number of floor joists and roof rafters. And so what I was doing was cutting all that stuff beforehand, and I had all the pieces uh, dimensioned. So finally, in the, uh, the spring of 54, it was uh, April 13th, I believe, I started building. I had had the hole dug, and uh, the foundation poured, and uh, so we started throwing wood across, putting in the flooring, and uh, I had no help. This was a one man job with, with these two hands, and uh, I told my wife we would be in by Christmas time. Well, one person building a house while holding on a full time job, that's, that's kind of a chore, but uh, that was. 25 years ago, and uh, I had a little more energy than I have now. But anyhow, on the 23rd of December, we did move in. It didn't look like a finished house at all. All that was between us and the outside was inch-thick black cellotex. Inside were stud walls. There wasn't really any plaster board on each side. I recall on Christmas Eve, Santa is supposed to come. Santa was dead tired, desperately wanting to clean in the sack. <laughs> but the little daughters, they, they were wide awake, and they could look right through the walls into the living room where we had put our Christmas tree. And one of them in later years confided that she saw Santa come that year. <laughs> Wonderful story. But, um, we, it really took me three years before it was, was finished. And uh, I put um, cracked field stone on the outside and stuff. Now this is a picture uh, of the house. And uh, when I take my glasses off and stand at one end, I can't even see the other end. It's that far. It's that big. And we have a full basement underneath. So Beautiful. that's where we raised our, our children. And we still enjoy living there. Beautiful. So you're a radiographer, you're a photographer. You mentioned to me that you sang uh, in the operettas, and oh, yes. I understand you've been singing for some years. I still sing at the uh, church I attend, yes. During the wartime, um, there was a quartet that sang each Sunday morning over, I think it was WJR. Um, Hymns of Freedom, I think it was called, and I sang the tenor part in, in that quartet. That was kind of fun. It certainly was. Enjoy music uh, other than your own performance? Oh, sure. You know, it took my parents about four years to learn that I would never be a pianist. 
they had me taking lessons, but I don't write from the start. I'd never be a pianist, but it took them four years before they gave up. And it took them about six months to learn that I'd never be a violinist either. So I can't do anything with either of those instruments now. We have some contemporary hobbies that are very interesting. Well, I have uh, more lots of hobbies. Uh, Radiographing flowers, woodworking, inventing different things. This has all been very interesting to me. Would you share some of those with us? One day at the banister at the corner of State and University, they were offering daffodils, cut daffodils, I think for 39 cents a dozen. Today, I don't think you'd even get one for 39 cents, but you got a whole dozen in those days. And I recall I took it to the x-ray department and uh, used my reader machine and made a picture. Well, it wasn't a very good picture, but it was a picture, and that sort of whetted my appetite. And uh, so from then on, I uh, developed uh, equipment and techniques so that now there are uh, two of us in the country who are recognized as contemporary botanical artists who deal in this particular medium. The other man is a retired person from, from the Eastman Kodak Company. And uh, also I already brought the flowers in the museums. Uh, they were first published by the National Geographic Society in what they call their school bulletin. Let's see if I can find the school bulletin here. Well, this is the school bulletin. I would rather they had published it in the magazine, but the editor said it didn't quite fit the format. Now, this was a picture of Jack in the Pulpit, and then the interior here, they have additional pictures. Beautiful. The Encyclope Encyclopedia Britannica has published one that I know of. They have appeared in numerous places. I did one in color that appeared in the front cover of the Detroit Sunday Free Press magazine section. Now, this is novel. I don't think it's very pretty. I prefer the black and white ones. Now, folks ask, how do you make radiographs of flowers? Well, just like you radiograph anything, you put the object between the film and the source of radiation. Now, if you have an industrial x-ray machine that's designed for radiographing locomotive wheels, and if you were to use such a machine as that on a person, you would penetrate the tissues so well you couldn't distinguish tissue A from tissue B. So you need a people machine for a people. Now, when you use a people machine on plant material, you scarcely distinguish one part from another. You need a special machine with very, very, very low energies. In fact, when you radiograph pollen grains, I have to work with energy so low that even a few millimeters of air would act like a lead wall. So I must work in a vacuum. Well, here, there's a suitable energy that's correct for radiographing plant material. So to make a color picture, you simply set up the, picture, the flower and choose a very low energy that will penetrate the thinnest parts, but not necessarily the thick parts. And I will change films, go to a much higher energy, so that you penetrate the thick parts. And then the third picture is exposed at an intermediate energy. So you only have three black and white radiographs. And then by using or the wash off relief process or dye transfer method, such as I did for this uh, picture of the fruit in the silver bowl, then you can make, uh, make colored radiographs. Or any of the usual printing processes. So that was a real thrill to have a, a front cover. Could we just pause here for a moment and take a look at some of your works? Now, well, 
this is a picture of an iris. And I've had to develop special techniques to show detail on the parts that would normally be uh, so thick they just render black. So we've gone from white to black. And here's even thicker stuff that'd be black, but you can't go blacker than black. And so I've had to innovate and in these thick parts then you go from black back to white again. So it's a kind of a hybrid picture that shows the details in the various thicknesses. It's beautiful. Well, that's an example of that sort of work. Then there have been other, other things. I, uh, I innovate, I invent things. My very first attempt at uh, inventing anything, well, let's see. I think the first thing I did, I invented an automatic transmission that went forward and backward and neutral and was terribly inefficient. So that never got off the ground. I think the next thing I tried my hand at was uh, an entirely different field. When you're making pastry, you use shortening. Now, shortening is messy stuff to try and measure. And so I thought, well, why don't we make it in granular form and coat it with something so it wouldn't stick together. And then when you wanted a half a cup of the stuff, you just pour it out. And so we envisioned making these little goblins of shortening coated with uh, dry milk. Well, before I did anything about that, the Bisquick people came out, and they had used the same concept. So I was beat out on that one. Uh, here is a meter I devised that would help me in my work. In the early days, we always put the thing at an angle to the tooth. This is called the bisecting principle. And it depended upon the inclination of the tools, the position of the patient, and many factors like that. And it, it involved quite a bit of guesswork and head scratching. And so I thought, there must be a better way than that. So I recall one night on the back of an envelope at home, I worked out the mathematical relationship between the inclination of the film, the tooth, the angle between the two, and what the proper direction would be. Then I had to work out a device that would work according to this uh, algebraic relationship. And uh, from the ones that I worked out, something of this shape seemed to be the best. So to use this, this uh, arm causes the dial to rotate. The point is a pendulum that always points downward. And so I simply align the edge of the case with the edge of the fin, and then this is aligned with the long axis of the tooth, and then it immediately tells you what the proper vertical angle is. Well, I patented this, and the one company thought it's the world's greatest. You know, they couldn't even give them away as golf prizes. <laughs> they were asking all of $15 for these things, and I don't think they sold more than 100 of them. <laughs> So, strike one. Huh? Yeah, that, that was a, a disaster of the first order. But that was my, my first attempt. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.